Well, hello, and thank you for joining us today. During National Kidney Month in March, we held a live stream session to talk about managing kidney disease. Today, we're here to talk about research efforts that we hope to improve the treatment, outcome, and lives of people who have chronic kidney disease, or CKD. I'm Dr. Griffin Rogers, Director of the National Institute of Diabetes, Digestive, and Kidney Diseases at the National Institutes of Health. I'm joined today by my colleagues, Dr. Robert Starr, who is a director of the Division of Kidney, Urologic, and Hematologic Diseases, or KUH, and Dr. Paul Kemmel, who is a KUH program director. Dr. Starr and Kemmel are both physicians and scientists who specialize in kidney disease research and optimizing CKD prevention and management. Throughout our discussion, we'll be answering some commonly asked questions about kidney disease and research. If we don't answer your question during the live video, please check our social media feed at NIDDK.gov, where we'll continue to try to answer your questions as they become available. Thank you for joining me today, Dr. Kimmel and Starr. Dr. Rogers, thank you for having us. Yes, thank you very much. Thanks. Well. As you know, chronic kidney disease, or CKD, is a serious condition affecting about 37 million Americans. It's chronic, it's consequential to those who have it, and it's costly to the U.S. healthcare system. Now, considering today's theme of hope through research, could you start us off by discussing some background on CKD research? Why we study this disease? What are, the, what are we currently researching? And where are we going? Yes, Dr. Rogers, NRDDK is conducting research related to both chronic kidney disease and end-stage kidney disease, or ESRD, in a very broad range of areas. Just to mention five briefly, uh, first is creating a precision medicine approach to conquering kidney disease, where we can give the right intervention to the right patient at the right time. I'm pleased to announce that the new version of this um, is um, being announced today. And I want to thank Dr. Rogers for almost doubling the amount of money that will be going into this program. The second program is rebuilding an artificial kidney or bioartificial kidney that um, will allow um, patients' kidneys to be either repaired or um, to replace kidneys that are no longer working. I will talk about this next. Thirdly, um, studying people to find out which kidney diseases are caused, caused by genetic causes, where we might have a, a, a completely separate way of patient-specific way of treating them, and then finding ways to improve the numbers of kidneys that are being donated so that we can decrease the length of time that people have to wait for kidney transplantation. And finally, we'll talk a little bit about how COVID-19 affects the health of, of patients with kidney disease. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Starr. You know, you mentioned that NIDDK is supporting creating alternatives to uh, kidney dialysis, perhaps even creating organs in a dish that might be transplanted into patients. Could you talk uh, a little bit more about this uh, area of research? Sure, Dr. Rogers. At NIDDK, we're funding a consortium called Rebuilding a Kidney that will help repair, regenerate, and also build new nephrons that are the functioning parts of the kidney. This group is approaching, has two major approaches. The first is quite audacious, and that's to rebuild a damaged kidney that's um, been damaged and perhaps has areas of fibrosis or scarring. This is being done using small molecules or drugs, proteins or organoids, which are balls of cells that can be created from a patient's own cells, or grafts to repair the kidney to improve the function of the kidney that's in the person who has chronic kidney disease. The, the second part is actually harder, and that's to try and build a functional replacement kidney, either a biologic kidney, a bio-artificial bio kidney, where there's both biologic as well as um, artificial or plastic or whatever parts, um, that that kidney could then be transplanted back into a person. This rebuilding kidney group brings together both of these groups in an incubator. We found the best people that we can to work on these problems with very diverse scientific backgrounds. 
and we're asking them to work together to incubate their ideas and come up to come up with solutions to these very complex perplexing problems. Well, thanks. By the way, if you're just joining us, I'm Dr. Griffin Rogers, director of NIH's National Institute of Diabetes, Digestive and Kidney Diseases, and I'm here with my colleagues, Drs. Robert Starr and Paul Kimmel, to discuss NIH research on chronic kidney disease. As we look for new solutions to complex problems, NIDDK is also exploring ways to develop treatment for people with chronic kidney disease that is tailored specifically for that individual person through a consortium that you've heard Dr. Uh, Sar just mentioned called the Kidney Precision Medicine Project or KPMP. Dr. Kimmel, can you talk a little bit more about KPMP? Sure. I think this is an exciting program which uh, I'm very enthusiastic about. We, we all know that advances in treating chronic kidney disease over the past 50 years have helped improve outcomes for patients with kidney disease. But as we study kidney disease more, we see the more we study the disease, the different pathways can lead to differences in how individual diseases develop in individual patients. We think the treatments targeted to the individual, an approach that has been called precision or personalized medicine, may be more effective than a one-size-treats-all approach. For CKD patients, this approach may be based on a genetic understanding of a person's disease that may provide clues to their being a part of a CKD type or a subgroup. The NIDDK-funded Kidney Precision Medicine Project, or KPMP, studies these subgroups with the goals of developing targeted treatments based on specific subgroups of CKD so we could end up delivering the right treatment to the right patient at the right time. KPMP has four goals. We're going to collect and evaluate biopsies as tissue samples from people with CKD. We'll define chronic kidney disease subgroups. We'll identify critical cells and pathways and use them to try to develop new therapies. And we will use the data we generate to create a kidney tissue atlas. This project is already underway and is in a mature phase. We've collected 80 biopsies from altruistic volunteer participants, more than two thirds of whom have CKD who are functioning as partners in our study. The researchers are going to and analyze the samples, create images based on the data, and share the data with the research community, and perhaps more importantly, with the patient participants. And through this process, we will build a kidney tissue atlas. Our ultimate goal is to use the atlas to identify targeted treatments for people with kidney disease. We hope that KPMP research will make personalized, effective, and safe treatments possible for people with many different kinds of kidney disease. Oh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Kimmel. We're getting a few questions in uh, from our uh, audience now, and it looks like the first one is a spinoff of a question or a comment that Dr. Starr made. So let me start with him. There are actually two questions. Uh, but we'll we'll start we'll sort of lump them together. So the question is for people needing a new kidney, have you heard of 3D kidney printing uh, with the patient's healthy kidney cells that are harvested and grown in the lab? Um, so and the other question that would seem to be related to that is uh, is NIDDK involved in any research currently on kidney organoids? So th thank you, Dr. Rogers. The answer to both is yes, and the Rebuilding a Kidney Consortium is working on both of these. So 3D printing is being used by consortium members to print small parts of the kidney, the filtering part, which is a ball called the glomerulus, as well as these long tubular structures where parts of, of what you need is returned back to the body. Um, what they're trying to do, and, and, and where the 3D printing has been really helpful is to understand how the cells organize into to structures 
and how they talk one to another. Um, the, the kidney has these complicated, complicated convolutions where the tubules uh, come back and forth on each other. And what they're finding as they bioprint the tubules is that where the parts of the kidney curves back on each other, those cells are different at the top than in the straighter parts. They function differently. So they have been using bioprinting to make um, different parts of the kidney. What they haven't done yet is to bioprint the whole organ. That, while sounds simple, is actually quite difficult in getting the plumbing to work and getting all the cells to, to line up, but, but they're beginning to move in that direction. As far as organoids, so organoids are produced when you take cells from the body, put them into a, into a plastic dish, and give them a bunch of growth factors in the right order that replicate some of the development that occurs in the kidney. The kidney is anatomically complex, that um, looks disorganized, but actually has a very quite beautiful structure to it. Um, and when you do this in a dish, it doesn't have the beautiful structure. The cells are all disorganized. They're fragments of things. They don't line up properly. They don't connect together. So what the NRDDK researchers are doing is trying to figure out how to use the wall of cells that's created these organoids, but then get them to vascularize because we need blood coming into the kidney to be filtered and cleared and supply oxygen to the organ. And we need tubes to pull the waste products out. So by flowing fluid over the surface of these organoids in a culture condition, a group has discovered that the blood vessels grow in better and the cells become more mature. One of the problems in the existing organoids is the cells are just way too immature to do the kinds of things that they need to do. So, so both of these are really great questions and NRDDK funded scientists are working on both quite. Uh, oh, thanks. Thanks very much for, for that answer. Um, Dr. Kimmel, I have a question uh, for you. It follows um, some of the comments that you just made. And the question goes, how can researchers and or the people with kidney disease get involved in the research that, that you've mentioned? That's a great question. Um, I think that uh, NIDDK and the KUH division have taken to heart the ideas of patient engagement in research um, from the ideas for research initiatives all the way to participating in the design of studies um, and the oversight of research that's ongoing and the return of results to patients. Uh, KPMP is a very good example of that because we originally conceived of KPMP as having patient advisors from each one of the investigative groups. Uh, that's turned out to have functioned as a really strong working committee among the KPMP investigators called the Community Engagement Working Group. Um, the Community Engagement Working Group members attend all the steering committee meetings and they interact with the researchers when they have questions about the patient experience. So it's a really wonderful bi-directional exchange of ideas. And our patient advisors have helped us a great deal in devising ways to make a project like KPMP, which depends on uh, altruistic volunteers, um, more acceptable to the greater community. And so that uh, patients who are asked to participate will understand why they're being asked and what the results of this kind of gift could be. So um, we value that relationship. We've also had patient engagement be a part of several other studies within KUH, such as Apollo and the HOPE study. Good. And you just heard Dr. Kimmel uh, reference two additional studies, Apollo and, and uh, the HOPE study. Uh, every federal study that I'm aware of has to have an acronym. And so uh, those, 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 those uh, uh, both of those studies uh, are, in, and you can learn more about it by visiting our website, are, are acronyms for very important studies. Um, just a quick follow-up to what you were just mentioning, uh, Dr. Kimmel. Uh, 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 an audience member asked, is in the KPMP, 
what happens to the kidney samples that are taken from the participants? That's, that's a very good question. It's at the heart of the way the KPMP is designed. Patients who usually don't undergo kidney biopsies because clinicians thought they understood the diseases and didn't need the help from evaluating the tissue um, are being asked to provide biopsies for altruistic and research reasons in KPMP. And the diseases that we're looking at are uh, acute kidney injury, but pertaining to CKD, they're looking at patients who have CKD that's been attributed to high blood pressure and to diabetes. After those biopsies are obtained, they're very carefully and very quickly um, uh, frozen and uh, carefully distributed to the pathologists who will provide an excellent histologic diagnosis for the patient and the clinician. And at the same time, those tissues are being sent for very rigorous analyses of genetic uh, expression um, and uh, evaluation of the metabolic structure of the uh, kidney tissue, as well as uh, the evaluation of uh, the proteins in the tissue. And by doing this kind of analysis in several different labs, which may evaluate one person's kidney tissue, we hope to understand in a comprehensive synoptic way how these different parts interact to cause disease, which will hopefully help us develop the tools to counteract the disease as effective therapies. So it, it sounds like uh, what you're saying, you're, you're doing a bit of a deconstruction and actually even looking at the expression of genes and proteins and metabolites, even at the level of a single cell. And then at some point, there will be a reconstruction to try to fully understand how these cells once together actually interact with, with one another. It really is, is, is groundbreaking uh, research. Th thanks for that answer. Yes. Well, as both of my colleagues, I'm sure, know, we're sort of uh, in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic, an area of research that was not really on our radar just even a few years ago, but it's now critically important. We now know that people with kidney disease are at higher risk for developing serious complications uh, from COVID-19. Dr. Starr, I know you're involved in researching the convergence of these two diseases. Can you tell us about this particular area? Sure, Dr. Rogers. So we've known for a long time that chronic kidney disease disproportionately affects black people. And Dr. Kimmel will talk a little bit more about this soon. During the pandemic, we've quite unfortunately discovered that COVID disproportionately affects black people also. We're now studying how these two relate, how CKD predisposes to COVID and how COVID causes or promotes chronic, acute and chronic kidney disease. In fact, NIDDK is supporting research to better understand both of these questions, how people with diseases like CKD are affected by COVID-19 and ways to lessen some of these more severe effects. It really is a terrible, terrible cycle. We're finding that kidney disease is a risk factor for COVID, which itself leads and causes acute kidney injury which can then lead to chronic kidney disease, as Dr. Kimmel has published about a lot, and also accelerate pre-existing chronic kidney disease. To help stop this cycle, NADDK is funding research to look for proteins in the kidney that might be binding the SARS-CoV-2 um, virus, the COVID receptors, to explain why patients get acute kidney injury and why that becomes chronic kidney disease, as well as why chronic kidney disease is a risk factor for COVID-19. My own laboratory is studying how COVID damages cells throughout the body, including the power supply in the cells, the mitochondria, and how bits of damaged mitochondria um, go on to then damage other cells throughout the body. We and others across the United States have in the process of developing blood tests for organ damage caused by COVID. And my lab at least has identified a pathway that might be responsible for COVID-induced 
organ damage, and we're now looking at a couple of different ways of intervening with drugs. NIDDK and NIH is uh, funding a very large project on the so-called long haulers, the people who had COVID for more than a couple of months and who have uh, really terrible symptoms of brain fog, persistent, persistent fatigue, breathing difficulties, joint pain, and memory trouble. And NIH task force is working on how, um, how, what that disease is and what to do about it. And um, there are a variety of research opportunities that are being looked at right now. Um, some of these are, um, people are looking at things that are caused by cytokines, these um, alarmins that are made during the infection, but it's probably more complicated than that, probably multifactorial. I, I think we'll end up, uh, if we've been using the term precision medicine here quite a bit, I think there are different kinds of COVID-induced damage to the body, and each one will probably require somewhat different therapy. And that's what makes this so hard to figure right. out. Well, certainly as a certainly is a very important area of research and uh, I also want to sort of take the opportunity to highlight some of the precautions of course that people with CKD should take to avoid getting COVID-19 uh, in the first place obviously including limiting uh, interactions with people you don't live with in your household as much as possible practicing social and physical distancing staying at least six feet away from other people who are not from your household, both indoors and outdoor spaces. Wear a mask to protect yourself and others and wash your hand often. And of course, when your time becomes available, get a COVID-19 vaccine uh, when you can. This is really uh, the most important thing that you can do to protect you, your families, your loved ones, your colleagues, uh, and others. Well, one aspect of CKD that was brought up earlier was how it disproportionately affects minority groups, including black people. NIDDK, like all of the NIH institutes and centers, has a mission to address health disparities. Uh, Dr. Kimmel, can you talk uh, about some of the efforts uh, that NIDDK supports in this area? Sure. We've known for a very long time that CKD disproportionately affects certain groups compared to others. I remember in one of my medical lectures in the first year of medical school in 1973 that it was clear that African Americans had a much greater rate of developing chronic kidney disease and specifically the old diagnosis of malignant hypertension than other people. And as an example today, black Americans are more than three times as likely to develop kidney failure than white Americans. What's happened over the last 15 years is in many cases now we know that it's related to genetic factors. Variants or small changes in a specific disease identified through NIDDK research called APOL1 contribute in a meaningful way to the increased risk of kidney disease in black Americans. Having two copies of certain forms of the APOL1 gene puts people at increased risk of developing kidney disease and having kidney disease progress when it's present. To determine what happens in people with APOL1 variants if they donate kidneys for transplantation, NIDDK is funding a large study called Apollo. And as Dr. Rogers pointed out, all these studies have acronyms. Apollo stands for the APOL1 Long-Term Outcome Study. And Apollo will look at more than 2,600 pairs of black kidney donors and the recipients of those donated kidneys over time. Involving communities and groups most affected by kidney disease is one way that NIDDK is working to reduce disparities. I'm very proud of Apollo because it has a community advisory council made up of black kidney donors and their recipients, as well as people with CKD to provide valuable input on things like study design and recruitment and retention of patients. So similarly to the KPMP project, patients are involved at every step of the research, seeing all the data, 
seeing the recruitment statistics, and they're not shy about providing their opinions to the investigators. I think that's a good thing because it makes this study more responsive to the community. We ultimately hope that what we will learn from Apollo will be used to improve the outcomes for everybody after kidney donation and after kidney transplantation. And perhaps if results from Apollo are as we think they may be, that it will help in revising the kidney allocation system. Black people are, of course, not the only group facing disproportionate odds, certainly with respect to kidney disease. Hispanic people and American Indians are more likely to be diagnosed with kidney failure. And it's important to point out that socioeconomic factors, not genetic factors, like income, neighborhood, and access to food, so-called social determinants of health, can also affect outcomes in patients. NIDDK is working with other NIH institutes to better understand these issues. We can see the effects of health disparities through a broad lens, but we also know that there are issues with specific CKD areas, such as diagnosis and treatment. So just to point out a few ways that NIDDK is investigating these issues, NIDDK is supporting research to explore new ways to accurately calculate the estimated glomerular filtration rate without relying on information about a person's race. This is an important issue for the United States right now and for all patients with kidney disease. Right now, one way to diagnose CKD is to test how well the kidneys work using this equation that will give us an answer of estimated glomerular filtration rate. And that current algorithm or calculation for EGFR uses information about a patient's race. Race is a social construct, not a scientific one. But we have to consider if that construct is removed from the current EGFR calculation, it could lead to misdiagnosis. So it's important that NIH and NIDK research in this area will help to eliminate health disparities. So stay tuned to what happens with this area of research. All right. Well, well thanks for that. Thanks for that answer, Dr. Kimmel. You know, what I would say is obviously regardless of a person's race or genetic ancestry, there are steps that someone with CKD can take to help them manage their disease. Uh, Dr. Starr, could you walk us through some of the ways that people can manage their disease? I think it's really important that people with chronic kidney disease understand that you can manage your own disease. And there's some steps that you can take that I'm going to outline that are really important. The first one is to work with your healthcare team to monitor your kidney health where you are and develop a kidney, a comprehensive kidney care plan. What this means is being proactive, asking lots of questions. Yes, your healthcare team may be fragmented. You have to see a cardiologist and an endocrinologist and a nephrologist, and they're speaking different languages and they're not talking to each other. But what you can do is to push them together and ask, please come up with one treatment, one set of treatments that I can do um, to get around the fragmented care. The other important thing is to ask for the new drugs that are out there. The ACE and ARBs that we've been using for the last 20 years were revolutionary. There are newer drugs on the market that are even better. Make sure you're getting them if they're good for you. Um, aim to get the COVID-19 vaccine when you can, of course. Um, make sure you spend about 30 minutes a day being active, physically active. Limit how much alcohol uh, and smoking products that you use. It's critical critical to control your blood pressure and to work towards controlling your blood glucose if you have diabetes. Take the medications as they're prescribed. And then for kidney, for people with more advanced kidney disease, um, it may be important, and here you have to talk to your doctor, to choose foods that have less salt and sodium and maybe more protein. But, but talk to your doctor, talk to the dietitian, but be proactive, ask a lot of questions, and, and, and don't allow the fragmented healthcare system to give you the healthcare that you need and deserve. Well, 
Dr. Starr, thanks for that very practical uh, advice. That's, I think, information that, you know, uh, certainly our patients and providers uh, should share with their patients uh, in a sense, regardless of, of what their etiology is. Uh, and with respect to the etiology, it looks like you have a question here that's directed to you, Dr. Starr. Uh, just came in. I know that there are many clinical trials going on on rare kidney diseases like FSGS and uh, IgA nephropathy. Are you optimistic that this research and new treatments could change uh, CKD as well? I'm incredibly optimistic. When I look at what's happened in the area of FSGS or these glomerular diseases that the question asked about, the reason there's so much pharmaceutical company interest in these areas is that um, something has to be done to de-risk, to make it easier to develop drugs in these areas. In this particular case, it's the FDA did something. They made it clear what kind of outcome they would accept. But this concept of de-risking is really important. What the Kitty Precision Medicine Project is trying to do is to de-risk the whole area of kidney disease, to have us understand the various causes, plural, of human kidney disease, chronic kidney disease, and acute kidney injury that Paul, that Dr. Kimmel talked about. And so that we have better understanding, we'll also develop better markers for which patient needs which drug, which means the drug's more likely to be effective in that person. So this idea of de-risking is really important, and that's what ties together the two parts of this question. Thank you. Thanks. And here's another one for you, Dr. Starr. Um, since you're on a roll, what do you think is the most likely to be the first uh, positive outcome at the intersection of the study of COVID-19 and kidney disease that you alluded to uh, earlier? Um, th th this is a harder, <laughs> this one's a little harder. Um, I, I think there are two areas that potentially will help. One is that there are a, a couple of studies um, that are ongoing right now to look at various um, pharmaceutical interventions to help either uh, prevent COVID, decrease COVID, or decrease kidney attack, the, COVID, the way COVID is attacking the kidney. We're hoping that one or more of those will work. The other thing that will help is to develop um, some more specific markers to figure out what kind of injury, what kind of kidney injury that particular person has. I, I alluded to, but now I'll say more strongly that there are probably four, five, six different mechanisms, ways by which the kidney is getting injured during COVID. And if you give, if you think it's mechanism A, but the patient actually has mechanism B, it either won't work or could be harmful. So what we need are a set of markers to better understand which mechanism is active in which patient. So I think that those are going to be the, the first steps forward. Thanks. Just to, to, to sort of follow on uh, what you were saying uh, about that practical advice you were giving early, I, I do want to mention that last month when, when we did this live stream about managing uh, kidney disease and, and we gave some of those practical tips as well, it's important that you don't have to adopt all of these habits at once. Uh, setting goals for yourself and starting with the habits you know you can be most successful with can at least begin to build a confidence that you need to help you tackle those changes that are you find much more challenging. But Dr. Kimmel, what gives you the greatest hope uh, for people with or at risk for kidney disease? And what would you tell a person with CKD about NIDDK's funded research that's happening now? You know, that's a, that's a very interesting question. I, we were just discussing this in our staff meeting, and I remember the times when the outlooks for patients with diabetes and very mild signs of kidney disease were just dismal. I remember patients at the outset of developing signs of kidney disease being started on dialysis within a year, and that changed completely with the use of uh, disruptors of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, drugs like ACE inhibitors, and more recently ARBs. I think we are on the verge of uh, greater changes in the horizon for patients with kidney disease. The new SGLT2 inhibitors 
look like they have spectacular effects to um, ameliorate uh, kidney disease in clinical trials. It's important that they be used in real world settings for patients with diabetic kidney disease. I think we're also seeing that um, new treatments for hypertension and new hypertension treatment goals, such as outlined by the SPRINT, may result in longer lifespans for patients with kidney disease. So we've also seen advances in the outcomes for patients treated with uh, dialysis and kidney transplantation. So I think that in all these arms of research where we're finding out how more how cells interact with each other in ways that may be deleterious or may be salutary, provide incredible hope for people with kidney disease over the span of our lifetimes. It's a very exciting time for research now. And it really does underscore the message uh, that's central to this Facebook Live event, hope through research. Uh, and as we you know, have recommendations to make now, the research as it is proceeding is going to give even more hope uh, moving to the future. Before I, I go to another question for you, Dr. Starr, here's a question that came up uh, in the uh, chat box uh, for Dr. Kimmel. Uh, and that is, we of course know about the benefits of, of exercise and, and what you eat in many settings, including in kidney health, but does sleep or lack thereof have an effect on kidney health? That's an interesting question and is actually a great area for research. One of the things that's important, and uh, this is not known by many physicians, but uh, advanced kidney disease and perhaps in earlier stages of kidney disease, it's very common to have a um, illness called um, obstructive sleep apnea that's associated with poor sleep and daytime sleepiness. And this disease is associated with hypertension and relatively poor outcomes. So um, we know from many studies that good sleep is quintessential to good health. So if patients are having trouble sleeping, it's important to speak to your physician to get a good history to find out whether it's related to um, kidney disease or related to some other um, situation because getting to the heart of why people can't sleep is very, very important to maintaining good health. So um, I think we're learning more about the links between uh, poor sleep, obesity, and chronic kidney disease, um, but this is actually insomnia poor sleep habits. It's a very important symptom for patients to follow up with their physicians. Absolutely. Before we answer the next question, I want to mention that we have information on NIDDK.NIH.gov available in English and in Spanish that is free and covers a range of topics on kidney health that Dr. Starr and Kimmel have just talked about uh, and more. We did get another question in, uh, Dr. Kimmel, and it relates to perhaps the, uh, the study that you talked about, Apollo. Uh, and the question is, what research is there on transplantation outcomes that we know about so far? Um, you know, I think transplantation is very, very important to the uh, ultimate outcomes of patients with kidney disease. When kidney disease advances to its final stages or most advanced stages, the treatment options for patients include dialysis and transplantation. And over the past uh, 25 years, it's become clear that transplantation is strongly associated with not only better length of life, but better quality of life. So it's the clear, uh, it's the clear preferred therapy for end-stage renal disease. A major problem that we have in terms of achieving our goals with transplantation is the fact that there are not enough living and deceased kidney donors. NIH 
and NIDDK research has expanded over the last several years in allowing patients who previously were not able to donate kidneys, uh, people who had been infected with human uh, immunodeficiency virus or hepatitis C virus, previously were not able to donate. As a result of research at several institutes within NIH, we've been able to expand the criteria for donating kidneys with extremely good outcomes in the recipients. So there is a great deal of research that's going on in transplantation based at NIDDK and uh, our sister institute, the National Institute of Allergies and Infectious Diseases, designed to uh, develop better ways to uh, evaluate rejection and to improve the long-term outcomes at the level of the kidney tissue in transplantation. But much work still remains to be done. Okay, thank you. Here's a question that came in that probably we may have started off uh, our discussions on, on uh, such a topic. Uh, and that is, uh, what are some of the symptoms of kidney disease? That seems like a foundational question. Rob, you want to take a, a stab at that? And, and Paul, you can join in afterwards. Yeah, so the, <laughs> yeah, the, the major problem, so to speak, with kidney disease is it's silent. It really is the silent killer. Until you get into very advanced stages of disease, you may feel absolutely nothing. Um, symptoms at that point include you know, um, being tired, either increased or decreased urination, uh, chest pain, dry skin, um, and then maybe swelling if, if your uh, kidneys are not working to control how much salt or um, fluid is in your body. But again, the important thing to remember is it's silent. This is not like a chronic painful arthritis and that's what's been what makes it hard to recognize that's why you have to screen for it with blood tests uh, urine tests um, it, it's not a symptomatic disorder mm -hmm. thanks anything I, I to add paul sure i, I think what uh, dr Starr said about the uh, fact that most patients who have chronic kidney disease don't have symptoms is really really important um, a recent uh, study that uh, had a high impact on changing the way that practitioners approach patients' health, the SPRINT, showed that the quality of life of patients with chronic kidney disease was exactly similar to those patients in SPRINT who didn't have chronic kidney disease, precisely for the reason that in early stages, the disease is usually asymptomatic. That makes it very important to have regular checkups, to have access to health care, so that any early signs of chronic kidney disease, such as high blood pressure, swelling, protein in the urine, abnormal laboratory values, can be picked up because the chances of good diagnosis and effective treatments are better when the disease is um, evaluated and diagnosed earlier rather than later. So I couldn't agree with Dr. Starr more. Well, just to, just to riff off that last uh, comment that you made, uh, uh, a, um, one of our participants asked, at what age? I mean, we know about the age for a lot of cancer uh, testing, uh, but is there a specific age uh, that people should be evaluated for the presence of kidney disease? It can happen any time. That's the problem. So there is the, the simple answer is there is no specific age, and that gets back to the screening thing that Paul was talking about. Uh, where it's particularly important to be screened is if you have high blood pressure, if you have diabetes. These are diseases. Paul used the word associated with chronic disease. That's absolutely correct, but they clearly do lead to chronic kidney disease also. So those are the two populations that we've been talking about screening for the last 10 or 15 or 20 years. Um, as, the, as our treatments are getting better and, pot and potentially work even earlier during the disease course, we can start thinking about screening in a wider zone. But, but age at the moment, there is no specific age. Absolutely. Dr. Kimmel, um, 
one of our um, uh, participants is asking, what effect does over-the-counter non-steroidals have? They heard that this was not a good thing to take a lot of. Is there any deleterious effects of, of, of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories on the kidneys? That's a, that's a very important question. Um, uh, part of the action of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs when they are working to alleviate pain is they're working at the same time to diminish kidney function. So they certainly uh, will decrease kidney function in people uh, who take uh, these medicines um, right at the time that they're being taken. Uh, this is even more important for patients with chronic kidney disease because it's clear for those patients that non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs can sharply decrease the glomerular filtration rate. A little more controversial is whether long-term use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs in patients without kidney disease causes kidney disease. And there is some evidence that they are deleterious, some evidence that they are uh, perhaps uh, not so deleterious. The important point for patients with kidney disease is those drugs should only be used under medical supervision because the risks and benefits have to be outlined very, very clearly. They're very important drugs to uh, alleviate pain, but there are alternative drugs. And uh, for patients with kidney disease, those drugs should really only be used in consultation with medical personnel. If I can add just a little bit to that and tie it back to the Kidney Precision Medicine Program. Um, the program project has only been around for a couple of years, but already is beginning to show signs of being really important and giving information that's important to patients. One of the things that it's finding is something that Kimmel has been talking about for a long time, as have I, of this intersection between acute and chronic kidney disease. And what we're seeing in KPMP biopsies is that even in the patients that are labeled as having chronic kidney disease, there's a lot of acute kidney injury in those biopsies, which raises the question of whether chronic kidney disease is actually a bunch of stacked acute kidney injuries one on top of the other. Where this gets to be important, and we don't know this yet, so I don't want to scare people, but you know, it's possible that using non-steroidals um, in, in somebody who's sort of predisposed for one reason or another to chronic kidney disease may, may be a bad idea. We don't know this yet, but, we're, but there's two different projects in NIDK that are beginning to look at these really important questions. So to this, this is the hope through research that Dr. Rogers started this on, is that we are finding new things through these projects, and the projects are information is beginning to converge, and that's what we'd like to see. Thank you. Well, it, we're getting close to the end of our segment. Dr. Starr, let me give you the last question. Uh, since you talk so much about uh, COVID and, and the relationship uh, intersectionality with kidney disease, and the question is, is it safe for and should a person with kidney disease get a COVID-19 vaccine? Uh, yes and yes. It's a pretty, pretty simple answer. Uh, you're in a high risk group for getting bad COVID. Please, please get the vaccine. That's right. And really follow those other recommendations uh, in terms of physical distancing and, and not um, um, making sure that you wear a mask until we get a point uh, in this country, which I hope will be relatively soon in terms of uh, reaching herd immunity. Uh, that will, will be so, so important. Well, thank you again today. Also, yeah, go right ahead, Paul. I, don't no, I, I think we should also say just for patients who are treated with dialysis, especially patients who are treated in dialysis units where physical distancing is hard to achieve. And for patients uh, who are transplanted, who are taking drugs that suppress the immune system, um, getting to the top of the vaccination list is really, really important. And of course, 
if you have any questions, consult your doctor. Thanks for letting me chime in, Dr. Rogers. Oh, absolutely. No, that's so important. You raised some valuable uh, information. Well, thanks again, Dr. Starr and Kimmel, for joining me today to talk about chronic kidney disease research supported by NIDDK that offers hope for the future and the steps that people can take today for better health. And thank you all for watching. We will post more information in the comments and we'll watch for questions that we weren't able to answer during this live event. If you have any more questions after the event ends, comment on this video and please visit us uh, at niddk.nih.gov for more information about kidney disease. And of course, <clears throat> you can also follow us on uh, our social media uh, at Facebook and Twitter, as well as uh, Instagram, at NIDDKGov. Thanks again. I'm Dr. Griffin Rogers, and thanks again for watching.